Our scripture reading this morning is taken from Acts chapter 6 and verses 3 and 4. If you turn with me so you can see the context of this uh, scripture. Let me know when you're there. All right, I heard a few, but Acts chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you, you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Pastor Dean. better? Somewhat? Testing? Good. All right. That's not always happens. We go from the hip to the pocket, figuring that's not going to happen, and it does. But either way, we're ready. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Good. Happy Sabbath to you all. Happy Sabbath. Uh, many of you know that, and this has been advertised at least for, I guess, two weeks now, uh, that next weekend we are going to have a very special uh, health evangelist come uh, to do some, uh, some work with us here in our church. You've seen that we've been instituting this health spotlight for the last few weeks, and a gentleman by the name of Rico Hill will be here next weekend presenting a very beautiful and very powerful message on health. Now, how many of you have heard of the name Rico Hill, or you know who he is, you know about his ministry? Uh, He does currently have a a television show on the 3ABN Dare to Dream Network called From Sickness to Health, and he also was into the... um, uh, television industry helped produce a lot of programming in Hollywood, and obviously God has transitioned him now, and he's pretty much full-time doing ministry, going around and teaching about health. So a very dynamic individual, and he will be here next weekend, Friday night, and I believe all of the, all the information is not on here. Either way, he'll be here Friday night, and I believe we'll probably have a starting time of 7 o'clock. Sabbath morning, he'll be taking Sabbath school uh, and the worship service and a seminar in the afternoon. And then Sunday morning will be a more practical, hands-on, interactive type of a demonstration uh, to kind of talk about natural remedies and some cooking techniques. And he also has literature and other things that uh, you'll be able to partake of. So I really encourage you uh, to be here next Sabbath and, or next weekend really, uh, to come and not necessarily support, but to get more information on how you can be healthier in these days and times. You'll also understand the connection between health and spirituality, which a lot of times we kind of miss that. We think our health and our spirituality are two different things, but they're actually very deeply connected. And really, if you want to draw closer to Christ, you must be able to be healthier for Christ. It'd be difficult to hear the Holy Spirit, to understand his word when we don't feel so well and when we're sick. So I also want to invite Silvana up briefly. Uh, She was there in Chowchilla when Rico came in February, and just want to have you share briefly, uh, and I'll let you, well, I was going to let you use mine, but I've got one back here for you. And just give us a short, you know, clip of what you learned and what was inspiring. Um, it was inspiring that he took everything that he presented to us from the Bible. Thank you. If you're on, he you took everything... Hello. There we go. Oh, okay. Everything, it was inspiring because he took everything that he presented from the Bible. And I want to start out with something that he quoted, calling it God's insurance plan. Psalms 91.3 says, Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. And it was, um, it was wonderful to see how from the Bible we have these Eight, princi- eight foundations that we just learned of were the ten principles of life um, to lead us. Um, he talked about the three different diets in the Bible, one being, and um, well, I can read them off to you, the three diets in the Bible being the original um, diet from Genesis 129, 
a diet of restoration given to us in Genesis 3.18, and then an emergency diet that God gave um, to man in Genesis 9.3. And it was um, inspiring to see how the Bible gives us this information, this way, this um, guide for living that will, number one, draw us to Christ spiritually, but also put us in a position to be able to draw others as well by being in good health. And then on top of it all, he shared wonderful practical principles, wonderful practical remedies that um, any of us can employ in order to, to gain good health and retain good health. It was inspiring. All right. Thank you, Savannah. So again, next weekend, Friday night, Sabbath, pretty much all day, and then Sunday morning, uh, we are going to be blessed, and you can definitely feel free to uh, invite friends and family. Now, his presentations, because he's coming to the church, uh, typically are geared towards Seventh-day Adventists, so some of the information he'll share will be things that we are familiar with, uh, quotes from the Spirit of Prophecy that we are uh, maybe are familiar with and some we may not be, but it doesn't mean you can't bring someone from the outside who can benefit from getting more information about health. Uh, and as you can see on the flyer, it's the great health controversy. So there's a lot of information that he'll bring that actually is exposing things that are going on in our uh, society right now, things that are being promoted to you as if they are healthy, but they're actually not. And it'll also show very clearly how Satan has used uh, even what's going on in healthcare and pharmaceuticals and how he has used that to make us sicker and weaker so we are less prepared for the coming of Jesus. So I really encourage you to come, and we'll get more information out to you as need be, and I'll make a phone call this week to remind you, and we expect to hopefully see you all there. So we also have communion this morning, and with that, we will have a shorter presentation of God's Word, uh, but still something that God has really laid on my heart, and something that uh, in our home, we have been attempting to try to perfect and do, which is very difficult in the way our busy world works. So I believe that this will be very relevant uh, for many of us here this morning. So as I get ready to share God's word, I solicit uh, your prayers for me, but really I encourage you to pray for yourself and say, Lord, will you speak to my heart? Will you encourage me? Will you convict me? Will you help me to know what is my duty and responsibility to you? And then also please pray that every word I speak comes directly from the Lord. Amen. Father in heaven, what a privilege and honor we have to worship you this morning on the Sabbath, to come to you and to uh, lift up our, our voices in praise and song, to give of offerings to you, and we also want to give our, our lives to you. We know that your word calls us to that, and I ask, Lord God, that as I speak your word, that it would be profound, but that it would be simple. It would be something we can fully understand, that you would teach our minds this morning, prepare us for even partaking of communion, uh, reorder our lives, Lord God, so that we are more ready for the coming of Jesus. Help us, Lord God, to be receptive to what you want to say to our hearts today. And so I ask for cleansing again for each one of us, for the power of the Holy Spirit to be in this place, so you would consume us, Lord God, with your presence. I pray, Lord, that you would also uplift your son Jesus, that Christ and his cross would be clearly presented and that you would help us, Lord God, to love you more, to know you more, and to live more for you. I must decrease, Jesus may increase, Lord God, and let that be uh, really the theme of each one of our lives, that there will be more of Jesus and less of us. We thank you, Father, in Christ's name. Amen. All right, if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. And when you are there, please let me know by saying, Amen. Amen. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Greeks against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason or it's not proper that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. 
Wherefore, brethren, look you out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Now, the last sermon we had here, we dealt with Acts chapter 6 and chapter 7 in a larger degree, uh, but the Lord brought me back to chapter 6. And actually, I was up in the middle of the night, <laughs> wondering why I wasn't sleeping, and this thought came into my mind, which I'll share with you this morning, which I know is from the Lord. Now, just a little context here, and I explained this to you the last time we dealt with this chapter of Acts, that the disciples naturally are seeing this new Christian movement growing by leaps and bounds. I mean, thousands of people are being added to the church day by day. Pretty amazing to see. And so naturally, the leaders of the church are experiencing probably a burden that they have never had before because the more people that show up, there are more people to serve. The church was also so loving, so into what they were doing, so focused on you know, the, the fellowship that Jesus wanted them to have and the loving unity they should have as a church that they were giving away food and, and, and probably money or whatever they could give, material things that people needed. And you can imagine, again, the more people join the church, the more people who have needs, the more things you have to distribute. And so what happened was the apostles, whose primary responsibility was to pray and connect with God in communion and to study and teach the word that their primary responsibility was threatened because they found themselves doing more distribution and serving of tables than they did of serving of the word of God. It became a problem, and whenever things are going really well, I've explained this to you before, Satan kind of gets in the midst of that and causes strife and disunity. So here the uh, Jewish Greeks, who were Hellenistic, they were ethnically Jews, but they were from a different area. They were not from Judea, so they had a different culture about them. They were there, but you also have the, the native Hebrews who were from Jerusalem, from Judea. They had a different culture than the Greek Hebrews, and so there became, became this little strife and battle between the two over who was getting uh, you know, the best distribution, and obviously the Greeks were saying they were getting a shorthand when they were giving away material goods and food. And the apostles recognize that this could get out of hand if they don't solve it, so they step in also recognizing that they are becoming more and more burdened with things that were not within their realm of responsibility, they called the church and said, look, we need to develop a system of organization to help deal with this because this is taking us away from our role that God has given us. So they found seven men. Eventually that order became the deacons. And those men served the tables. And you can see the apostles... They did this, they said in verse 4, we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The cool thing about what the apostles are doing here is that they recognized again what their role and responsibility was versus what it was not. Was it wrong to serve tables? Was it wrong to help the people? No, but it was not primary. It was not the thing that was most necessary for them. Their responsibility was prayer and study and preaching and teaching of the word of God. If they didn't do it, no one else would be able to do it. If they weren't the ones praying and studying as these church leaders, then the other church members would suffer as a result of not having the proper teaching and not having leaders that were connected to Christ. And you know how we get when we're not connected to Christ. You know how it, what happens when we miss that day of prayer, that time of study. Sometimes in one day we go from you know, jack, between Jacqueline and Hyde, you know? You have your good face on and your good attitude on, and all of a sudden we, we miss an opportunity with the Lord, and it turns ugly quick. They knew their role, and they made changes immediately once they recognized that that responsibility was threatened. I believe in the 21st century that although we are not ministering to as many people as they were ministering to. We don't have a, you know, we're going to take up an offering at the end of communion to help those who, who need help, uh, but there's no way that we are in a position where we personally are doing, dealing with exactly what they were dealing with, but in principle we are. 
because I believe that our society, our Western culture moves so fast. There are so many things to uh, take up our time and steal away our resources. I mean, we have families, we have spouses, we have children, we have relationships, we have jobs, we have, you know, houses to take care of, we have gardens to tend to, we have animals to take care of, we've got, you know, social media to get on. And these things take our time. And many of the things that do take our time, they all demand undivided attention. And not only that, with all of our great modern conveniences, many of these things actually, I believe, make our lives a lot more difficult. I've been, you know, thinking about this more and more, even as a, as a pastor. And I was talking about this with Maya over the last couple of weeks and shared this with a few other pastors. And that is that I really believe that because of technology, it makes my job as a pastor more difficult. You say, how? You can send emails, and you can do text messages, all, everything very quickly. And I say, yeah, that's more difficult, because if I didn't have that, I would have to come to see you, or you would have to come to see me, or we'd have to write a letter to communicate, not this instant text where you expect me to respond right away. And I'm sitting in a meeting. It's like, what are you doing, pastor? <laughs> now, no one really actually does that to me, but that's how you feel when a text comes or an email comes. Everything is right now sitting in front of you, and you get bombarded from every which way for, you know, uh, for things that people need, and I have two churches, and my two children, and my wife, and, you know, other responsibilities, and it becomes difficult. And I thought about the fact that if I lived during Ellen White's day, or the 1800s, or something, all I would need is my Bible, a horse to get around in, and that's it. See you at church, or I'm coming to your home, and I'll ride there, and ride a couple of miles back, and I'm done. It makes it harder, because our world is so busy, and things spin so quickly, when we recognize that we can also get detracted from our primary responsibility, which is prayer and the word of God. And we end up serving tables, doing things that are not wrong, not bad in and of themselves, but they're not primary and they're not priority. So busy, we don't have time for communion with Jesus. Now I heard one amen, so one person and myself find this to be difficult. But I would think maybe the silence means there's more conviction. Because you live in America like I do. We live in a society that expects us to be up when the sun comes up, and you don't get home till the sun comes down when you're working. Our society expects us to be busy. There's actually rewards and perks for being busy. There's some, actually two books. My, my wife reads books like she... I don't know, like she's crazy. <laughs> Audio books, physical books, doesn't matter if it's a book, Maya's on it. And she's, it's good because she likes to research and always sharing cool stories and information with me. But there's one uh, author she was listening to and the lady was reading her own book and she's telling a story about being in an elevator or something with a couple of lawyers and they're talking and chatting about you know, how long they've been working and you know, their work schedule and one guy says, man, I left the office last night at, you know, 10 p.m. The other guy tries to one-up him and says, man, I left the office last night at 1 a.m. And the other guy, and they looked at the other guy like, what time did you leave? He says, I haven't left yet. <laughs> it's almost like we get kudos the more we work and the more we labor and the busier we are, somehow that is now a status symbol to be busy. You ask people how they're doing. A lot's going on, busy. I say it too, it's hectic, it's busy. And sometimes we find ourselves not being able to jump off that carousel or jump off that, uh, off that hamster wheel or get off of the, out of the rat race and it's difficult because our society demands things of us. That if we lived in some third world country, I think some of us would be happier. You just go out and find your food in the field somewhere, hopefully, or at the market, come back to your little tent or hut and... Uh, Life is good. Turn me to Revelation chapter 12. Because there is a danger in our busyness. Revelation 12. A big danger in us losing sight of our priority. 
Look at verse 12. And this whole chapter is talking about really the controversy between Christ and Satan and how it affects his church. Verse 12, Therefore rejoice you heavens and you that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you having great wrath because he knows he has a short time. So we, God's church, find ourselves in the midst of a busy society. Everything is done quickly, and we realize that we have a little time to do a lot of things. Well, the enemy also knows that he has a little bit of time to get the church off track. And as I was studying this and thinking about this and the Holy Spirit giving me these you know, scriptures to, to share with you, I'm thinking in my mind, what would he want to do most? to get us off track. And there's a lot of things that the enemy can do. But then also started to think about why would he want to. And in this very same chapter, there are some really cool things in here about why he would want to get us busy, off track, and away from our priority, prayer and the word of God. Look at verse 17. And it says, The dragon was angry or wroth with the woman. Who's the dragon? Okay. The Bible tells us that in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, that the dragon is the serpent, the devil, and Satan. So we know that the dragon is angry with the woman, and in Bible prophecy, what does a woman represent? So Satan is angry and has wrath against God's church. And he went to make war. He went to fight with the remnant of her seed. So it also tells us he's not at war with every church. And every believer, he's especially at war with the remnant that believe the same things and teach the same things as the apostles did. To further identify this church, it says, they are the ones that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Satan is especially angry at God's church globally, but again, especially with those who keep the commandments of God. And what church exalts and teaches and highlights more than any other one obedience through faith to Jesus Christ and which one also identifies the commandments as being a last day issue in these times? Us. And have the testimony of Jesus Christ, which interestingly, Revelation also tells us And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See that you do it not. I'm your fellow servant of your brethren that have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. In a condensed sense, this is what it's saying. That the church who's teaching the commandments of God, which elevates the character of Jesus, who puts God, which puts God's moral law in front of the world and calls everyone to, highlight, to, to recognize Christ for his holiness and his righteousness, but also identifies this moral people. The same church, these same people will also have the testimony of Jesus Christ, which is the spirit of prophecy or the power or the breath or the life of prophecy within them, which says this church will also have the gift of prophecy. But it also says this, because if you look at Revelation chapter 10, it makes it very clear that this exact same church it doesn't just have the gift of prophecy. It was born out of prophecy. But also Revelation chapter 14 makes it very clear that the church was born out of prophecy, has the gift of prophecy, and its primary responsibility to the world is to preach and teach prophecy. So that's not just every church that the Satan, the Satan is angry with. No wonder he'd want to shut down Seventh-day Adventists, especially who highlight the law of God as a transcript of the character of Jesus as the moral responsibility that every man has in this world, especially as we see this world now taking God's law, turning it on its head or trampling upon it, and everything now that is approved in our society is the exact opposite of God's law. 
Think about it. I don't want to spend too much time on it. We'll get to it eventually. But think about that thought. Then now what is approved and acceptable in our society is the exact opposite of the law of God. Then Satan recognizes that there's a church that was born out of prophecy, has the gift of prophecy, and primarily preaches and teaches prophecy, and of course he'd want to get that church off the map. It goes deeper. Look at verse 11 of chapter 12. He also knows that this same church or these same believers would have a certain knowledge about them because they overcame him or got the victory over the devil by the blood of the lamb. Who's the lamb? It's the cross of Christ that gives us the amazing and powerful victory over sin in our lives. And so, of course, you'd want to get the church off track because they won't be able to teach the law. They'll forget that they were born out of prophecy. They'll deny the fact that they have the gift of prophecy. And they'll also forget to be teaching and preaching prophecy. But they'll also forget about the cross of Calvary and will not be able to teach Christ properly or teach victory over sin properly because they will not know how to overcome by the blood of the Lamb. So let's get them distracted so the church can't teach Christ and his righteousness. They also overcome by the word of their testimony, which is their personal experience with Jesus. And then lastly, they love not their lives unto the death. So he recognizes the recipe for victory over Satan is submission to Jesus Christ and having your sins washed away and cleansed away by the blood of the lamb. So you have victory over sin as, as opposed to being in bondage to sin. He also knows that a victory over Satan comes by having a personal experience with Christ as opposed to a formal experience with Christ, which is having the form of godliness that denies the power. And he also knows that people who have victory over him are people who could care less about dying. They're more interested in serving God than preserving their own lives. So he says, I'll get that church distracted and off course, because he knows that we are primarily the responsibility for also exposing his role in the great controversy and making sure this world is ready to meet Jesus when he comes. Because if he has a short time, the only reason it's short is because the Bible says that Jesus is coming how fast? Soon, quickly. And so because Jesus is coming quickly, he has a short time to do his work and his primary responsibility, his role, is to make sure that the church is not ready. Does that make sense? And how would he do this? Well, he does this in a number of ways, but we're highlighting just one major one this morning. We're almost done. Turn with me to Luke chapter 17. Luke 17. And let me know when you're there. Now listen to what Jesus says in verse 26. And as it was in the days of who? Noah. So will it be also in the days of the Son of Man. In Noah's day, they did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot. They did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus, it'll be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. What does that Son of Man is revealed mean? Jesus is saying, before, right before he comes, this is going to be the condition of the world. Now, you study you know, the condition of the world in Genesis chapter 6, and also in Genesis, in the, uh, I think it's the 20, I'm trying to think of exactly which chapter you'll find information about Sodom, but you can look it up. It's in the you know, uh, teens and the 20s of, of Genesis. And you look at the condition of the people during that time, and Jesus doesn't mention it here, but he's also inferring that those days were very evil and wicked. I started to pick up more on looking at Yahoo News and CNN, just so I can see what's going on in the world. And it is so crazy. Some of the ways in which people are dying today. I mean, I saw a number of individuals and it's stories about people who have been murdering their kids. 
in cold-blooded ways. The Bible says that sin is going to be so heavy and prevalent in our day, the love of people, the natural love, is going to grow cold. Then we look at the disasters and the tragedies and the storms. We look at our political situation. And you know Jesus has got to come soon. There's no way this is getting fixed by any person. Jesus said it existed before that same evil and wickedness and foolishness and unrighteousness was existent in that, in that day and it's going to be existent in our day. To the point in their day, sin was licensed. It was permitted and it was approved. And in our day, no different. But he also says something very interesting about that time. He says that in Noah's day, they were eating and drinking and marrying and in Lot's day, they were doing the same, eating, drinking, buying, selling, planting buildings. Is there anything wrong with any of that? No. no. Most of us in here are probably married. And you're eating. I'm going to do that in a little bit. Drink, a, you know, drink good, proper things, right? <laughs> Anyone sell anything recently? Buy anything recently? Plant something recently? Build something recently? Nothing wrong with it. But Jesus is making a very interesting observation about, our, about these times. He said before he comes, people will be so busy doing life that when judgment comes and Jesus comes, people won't even be ready. So busy that people won't be saved. Too busy to commune with God. So busy eating and drinking and hooking up and having relationships and planting and buying and selling and living life and working. That prayer and the word of God are abandoned for serving tables. Not bad things. Not the first thing. You say, well, those are the wicked people. When the professed people of God are uniting with the world, living as they live and joining with them in forbidden pleasures, when the luxury of the world becomes a luxury of the church, when the marriage bells are chiming and all are looking forward to many years of worldly prosperity, then suddenly as the lightning flashes from the heavens will come the end of their bright visions and delusive hopes. What happens in the world always infects and affects the church if we begin to do the same thing, caught up in the mode. So we've identified the problem. Now we've got to solve it. And there's always a solution. And straightway, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship, to go before him and to the other side. He sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to what? And when the evening was come, he was there alone. Jesus had three and a half short years to do the most amazing work any man has ever done in the entire history of mankind. He was busy, but not like us. His busyness was spent ministering to people. He was a carpenter, and then he was obviously an itinerant traveling minister, an evangelist, and healer. And no matter how exhausted and tired he was at the end of the day, because people would not give him any rest to pray. Sometimes he wouldn't even eat. He was so busy. And while the disciples are expecting him to say, all right, guys, let's go home and let's chill out and kick back a little bit. Catch a couple of Jewish sitcoms and, you know. Jesus said, disciples, I'll meet you in the morning. He tells the people, go home. And Jesus goes to a private place in the mountains and he has communion because he knew what his priority was. The most important thing was not serving tables. It was prayer and the word of God. Jesus is our pattern and our example. And if you find yourself living the life of the people in the days of Noah, 
busy in the usual round of things, so much so where you do not find time for daily communion with Jesus. Although you may be on a slippery slope, you can still make a change by the grace of God to follow the pattern that Jesus has set for us. I have a lot of quotes I could share with you, but I can't because it's like two pages. But if you want me to, you email me or call me or text me, and I'll get back to you when I can. And I'll send them to you because they are absolutely powerful, talking about not just what's coming on the earth and giving context for the fact we're living at the time of judgment and this is not the time to be doing random secondary things in place of the priority of spending time with God daily. But there's also some good information in here and some of these quotes about just our time with God and guarding our hearts. But I'll read this one quote, quote to close. God desires those who are connected with any branch of his work to be associated closely with himself. None need feel that they are too busy to pray, too full of business cares to spend an occasional 15 minutes to seek counsel from God. My brethren, make God your entire dependence. When you do otherwise, then it is time for a halt to be called. Stop right where you are and change the order of things. Pray first before taking up the work of the day. Do not go through a dry form of words. Be polite, inviting the heavenly guest to come in and take possession and to control every worker. In sincerity and soul hunger, cry after God. Wrestle with the heavenly agencies until you have victory. Put your whole being into the Lord's hands, soul, body, and spirit, and resolve to be his living, consecrated agency, moved by his will, controlled by his mind, infused by his spirit. Then the eyes of your understanding will be anointed with heavenly eye salve. Then you will see heavenly things clearly. Like Moses, you will catch glimpses of the Holy One of Israel. When we stop and make a change, and because of what I recognize even in my own life and how busy things get between the ministry of my home and the ministry to the churches, I'm constantly looking for ways to make things more simple. There are some things I was able to do when I was single that I can't do anymore because there's no time. There are some things I was doing before I had kids and I can't do them as much anymore because there's not as much time. Priorities have to shift and change. And if you recognize that your priorities are in the wrong place and you're caught up in the usual round and you're not spending at least 15 minutes daily connecting with the Lord and time in his word, then stop and change the order. I recognize as I, you know, my and I are trying to govern our home and having two kids under three is fun and fun. And I watch her, and she loves the Lord. And sometimes in the mornings, kids are up at 6, up at 7.30. There's just, you can't jump right into it. She picks up her little devotional in the morning. She's reading it while she's feeding the kids some oatmeal. Actually, they feed themselves. They're independent girls. They just, while she's monitoring the circus. But at night, after Nora goes down, and I put Shiloh down, no matter how late it is, and I'm already fading off to sleep because i got to get up and work in the morning. She goes in, turns on the light in the closet, closes the door, and I don't know how long or how much or whatever, but she and Jesus have communion. No matter how busy, time is made for God. And I admire that. Of course, my study and prayer has to happen because you'll know if it doesn't. <laughs> my job depends on it. Now, I don't look at it that way, but it does. <laughs> but I encourage you. How many of you feel the conviction today that you need to make a change? Yeah. Now, it may not come easy. And I wouldn't try to do it all cold. You know, I wouldn't try to do it, you know, over time. I do the cold turkey. Ellen White says, stop. 
halt, change. And whatever you can do, do it for the sake of your salvation. Don't be so busy that you're lost. Don't be so busy you are lost. Because we're living in the time of the judgment and Jesus is coming quickly. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that we can be saved because of the power of Jesus. That the glory of his cross is sufficient to be able to pull in every human being and us sitting in this church, we are not outside that influence of the cross. We love to be Want to, we would love to be in your kingdom. Lord God, but we recognize we live in the current nation, in a current kingdom that has us running constantly. Lord God, give us the ability to put you first. Time spent in prayer, time spent in the word, and then making serving tables second. Help me, help us. Father God, put a deeper love in our hearts for you and help us to see your love for us in a greater way that it will motivate us to make time for communion. I thank you for what you're going to do. And I pray especially for those who have no idea how they're going to make this work, but who have been dying spiritually and they know something's got to change. Heaven help us. Fathers, we go into foot wash, the foot washing. Remind us of the humility, the loveliness of Jesus. We come back and celebrate the emblems together. Remind us of that wonderful sacrifice that was made on our behalf. And also calling us to that same life of sacrifice. We thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen.